everyone and welcome back to Atman Unlimited. We're going to do another maintenance video on this episode and today we are going to be removing the spindle drive motor. So I've been having a vibration in the spindle somewhere since I bought the machine and in the last videos when I changed the belt I ran the motor manually with the uh, BFD drive in the back and I ran the motor up to 5,000 RPMs which is kind of where the vibration really starts to get going and I've been limiting myself to 5,000 RPM on the spindle just because I don't want the vibration to get away from you vibration is a big killer of bearings so by running the motor manually without the belt on it the motors vibrating so that's one source of vibration and there's a local motor repair house that can easily rebuild this motor and they gave me a really good price so we're going to pull the motor out and I'm going to have them clean the motor, inspect it uh, if it's all good put new bearings in it and then they're going to balance just the rotor so that the motor by itself will be balanced and then they'll put the pulley on the rotor in the correct orientation and location that it's going to be in when it's in the machine and then balance that as a system so the motor should be very nicely balanced and they're going to balance it all the way up to 7500 RPM which is the maximum spindle RPM for this machine. Now you can see I've already got a little bit of it disassembled. I'm going to cut in some footage uh, of some other work that I did just to show you the complete you know, disassembly of taking the sheet metal off and the uh, drawbar bridge and all that good happy stuff. Um, I also had to make an addition to the shop uh, so I'll show you some pictures but if you look up you'll see some chains up there I installed a chain fall and then uh, just a unistrut trolley track. So it's not rated very heavy, it's only rated for 300 pounds, but that's uh, enough to, to get the motor up. The motor's about 200 pounds, so still you know a third higher than what we're going to be lifting. And then I've also been quoting some jobs that are pretty large hunks of steel that weigh 100 to 150 pounds, and they're just way too heavy to muscle in and out of the machine by myself. Uh, so I'm also going to use that for material handling and I use the Unistrut track just because of cost and convenience. Uh, McMaster Car, thumbs up, wonderful place. Uh, I live in Buffalo, one of their main warehouses is in Cleveland. If I order it by 2 p.m. today it will be here tomorrow for ground shipping cost. So I get overnight delivery for ground shipping prices which is really cool. So the whole entire crane, chain fall, everything was like 150 bucks, you know, for lifting 300 pounds, you, you can't lose, you know, there's not too many things that can lift a good amount of weight like that at that price point. So that's why I did it. No, it's not 500 or 1,000 pounds, but so far I don't need that, uh, and if I need that, I'll figure something else out. But this was nice, cheap, and convenient. Okay, so what's this job going to involve? Basically, we pulled the sheet metal off. We're going to have to disconnect all the motor wires. We're going to have to take the box off for the alligator wireways. We're going to take the air filters off. We're going to take this top shroud of the motor off. We're going to strip the motor down as much as we can before we go to take it off just so that there's not as much bulk there to bang around. Uh, and then we'll, we'll pop the motor out and we'll get it on the ground, put it on a trailer, take it to the repair shop, and then hopefully it'll, it'll inspect okay and we'll put it back on the machine. So let's get started. Here we go, taking the sheet metal off once again. Now, you see the way cover removed here. You do not need to remove the Z way cover. All you need to do is pull the large piece of sheet metal that surrounds the motor and spindle. Now once the sheet metal is off, we're going to position our Z-head and then we're going to block the counterweight. This is very critical for this repair. You're going to be removing a lot of weight off of the Z-column and the counterweight's going to want to go down because you're taking weight off. So you must block the counterweight. After that, we're going to start disassembly. We're going to disconnect our airlines for our drawbar and our orient. We're going to disconnect the electrical connector. Now we pull the drawbar piston off. Now we're going to pull the drawbar bridge off. Now on my machine, I don't have a dual clutch machine with idlers, so just the motor tensions the belt. 
if you have a machine that has the, the two dual cam rollers, then there's a little bit more disassembly that has to happen. So I pulled the belt off, got it all loose. Now we're gonna climb up into the machine. We depowered the machine. It's very important that you disconnect the power to the machine for this. There's no way to isolate the spindle drive from the main power. So if the spindle drive has power, that means these leads at any time could have power. So right now the power of the machine is completely disconnected and locked out. You do not want the machine to be powered when you have these leads disconnected. Now a lot of people are nervous, scared, trepidatious about disconnecting and doing this type of wiring work. Some people will go through great lengths just to avoid disconnecting wires. Don't be afraid of wires. Just be afraid of live wires. So with the machine disconnected and locked out, there's no voltage here. Now what I'm doing is I'm very carefully marking all of the wiring. We cleaned it off. A lot of the numbers from the original factory are gone. So there's no markings on half of these wires. So I'll, they make a whole rainbow colors of electrical tape and it's good to mark all of the wires with a large band of colored tape. That way it is almost impossible for you to hook it up wrong. So then once we have all of the wires marked and only then will we start disconnecting things. Now you see that these are just got a lot of electrical tape wrapped around it and then they used a uh, nut and bolt to hold a bunch of ring terminals together. That's common. Uh, some people use wire bugs. Uh, some people use ring terminals. You know, it, it, it's common and an acceptable way to do this. Uh, it's nicer to put some shrink wrap over it, but shrink wrap is harder to get on and off, and then you run the risk of nicking the wire if you gotta cut the shrink wrap off. Now, when you take this apart, it's very important to inspect all your ring terminals. You wanna make sure that if there's a crimp connection on that ring terminal, that you inspect it and that it's still good. So now we've got all the power done, we're looking at the resolver wire and cable. Now the resolver connector here is in really poor shape. They used a Molex connector. There is very poor strain relief on the back side of that connector. Um, so that's going to lead us to some issues later on. Now there's also a ground wire that bonds this metal box uh, to ground. So we need to disconnect that ground wire and then everything will be disconnected in here. So I'm removing the back shell to see what kind of damage we got on the wire and, and this thing is toast. Uh, that zip tie was on so tight it crushed the wires. There was actually a broken wire on the pin so I was, I was quite surprised that the spindle encoder worked as well as it did. Um, there was one more wire that I found that I needed to mark and that is for the 120 volts that goes to the spindle cooling fan. So now anytime you got these large high pin count connectors it is good to take pictures. And when you take pictures, there's two critical things that you need to indicate in that picture. One is where is pin one? So pin one will normally be marked or have some type of feature to identify it. And then two, you want to be able to identify every single color of wire in which socket it is in relative to pin one. That way if anything breaks off or comes out, you can put it back together again. So there we just removed the spindle blower. And now we're going to remove the grease block off of the back of the... Um, the box here. Now we got everything loose, the box can come off the motor. When you're taking the box off, you got to be careful that it doesn't drop down and try to shear the wires off because the box is against the motor housing and the wires go through the box. So critical not to drop it and let it shear the wires. You can damage the insulation on the wires in the motor. So now once we got the box, we're going to very carefully fish the wires out. It's better to do the small wires first and then you get more and more room for the big connector to come out. Now that we've got the box disconnected, the motor is free and ready to come out. So we're going to disconnect it mechanically from the column. So there are, there's two ways you can take it out. One, you can either disconnect the motor from the motor plate, or two, you can take a whole motor plate out. I chose to take the whole motor plate out because the hole in the motor plate is just barely larger than the pulley. And it I, I felt it would be very difficult to get that pulley and fish it through the hole. So now we got the chain fall connected to the lifting point of the motor and we're taking out the last bolt and then we'll be ready to lift the motor out.
had to get the chair out to uh, talk about what's going to happen next. I thought I'd get in front of the train wreck that you're about to see. Now when you're doing this work, it's very important that you look at what you're doing and you understand how things are put together. Or else this is going to happen. Now, if you've done this before, and you saw the footage leading up to this, you kind of know what's going to happen. So what did happen? I had a plan. The plan was to hook to the motor at its lifting point. I know it's on the front and on the side. The motor is sitting on four standoffs. I assumed, incorrectly, that those standoffs were anchored into the Z head. Then what I was going to do is slowly lift the motor and tilt it backwards as it lifts and let the rear of the motor plate rest on those standoffs. When I got to the motor to roughly 45 degrees, I was going to push the motor back a little bit, lift the nose up, and then let it swing level. Okay, gently, you know, controlledly. However, the standoffs are not anchored to the Z head. So as soon as I started lifting, you're going to see them collapse. And you're going to hear a thud. Now I muted the audio clip to spare any of the younger viewers the obscenities that happened after that. Now, I got out lucky. We didn't damage anything other than a tiny little nick on the motor pulley. We just very barely kissed the spindle pulley once, but we didn't really hit anything and the motor mounting point took the brunt of uh, the little fall. And it wasn't really a fall, it was more just a controlled set down. We didn't damage the Z-axis bearings or anything like that. So we got lucky, but let this one be a lesson to you. A, nobody's perfect, and B, pay attention. I needed to clean off the bottom of the standoffs and verify that they were anchored in the head and I did not do that, which resulted in this issue. Okay? Now, once the motor fell, I had issues getting it out because the pulley ended up going in the cavity that's in the Z head, so I had a hard time getting it out. What I ended up doing is just very carefully muscling it out, and I kind of rotated it out while resting it on my leg. And if you watch the video carefully, I do have pretty good lifting posture, so I didn't hurt myself. But these motors are very heavy. I don't recommend doing this. When we go to put the motor back in, I'll show you the way I rigged it to put it back in, which is the way I should have rigged it to pull it out. The reason why I didn't do this is putting straps on a vertical cylinder is asking for them to slip, and slipping is bad. So we had to go through quite a bit of strapping to make sure it didn't slip. So uh, let's uh, roll my moment of shame and watch this footage. I muted the audio clip there because it went downhill very fast. Now as soon as I saw this motor wiggling, I should have stopped. I don't know why I didn't, but I didn't and now I got myself into a predicament. So there's a hole in the bottom of the Z column, or in the top of the Z column, the head, that the pulley kind of fished itself into, and now it's kind of in a weird spot. So I finagled a little bit and tried to get the motor into a position where I could just let it go, take a step back, think this through, and try to figure out how to get this thing out without damaging it, or more importantly, hurting myself. Um, these motors are 150 to 200 pounds, so I tried a whole bunch of things. The best thing that I could figure out, two arms, straight back, lift with the knees, and I didn't lift the whole load. I just tried to lift it and roll it up onto the edge of the, the Z head, and then uh, my legs sitting up on the table. I tried to use a piece of wood, but that really didn't work out. So now I just rolled it onto my leg that's on the Z table and rolled it horizontal, and now I'm just holding up the nose of the motor with one hand and then we'll lift up with the chain fall uh, to get it clear of everything. So in the end I was able to recover fairly gracefully. Now we're going to roll it out. I'm going to spin it a little bit make sure that I didn't completely annihilate it and then we'll lower it down to the floor. 
From there, I used the dolly, and then I loaded it on the trailer. So we got it on the trailer with a bunch of straps. Um, we were able to just use a dolly to roll it right up on the trailer so we didn't have to lift it. We uh, got the motor back from the rebuild shop, and unfortunately it didn't go as well as I planned. This motor was in very, very poor shape, but more on that later. Now, one of the things that the machine builders do, and I don't know why they do this, they really love these Molex connectors, okay? So these are just a standard Molex connector, pin, goes in the back, they're crimps. The issue with these is that if you saw the disassembly part, this connector kind of sort of had strain relief on it. But they put the zip tie on so tight, they pretty much crushed the wires. Now, this wire is 28 gauge wire, so it is very fine, and it breaks very easy. You can see with almost no force, you can rip these pins off. And these Molex connectors really don't provide good strain relief. The other thing that I find is that while a lot of people are very, very good at machine maintenance and machine repair, um, Unfortunately, I, I see a lot of bad electrical repairs, and this is another example of that. Um, one of these pins, the wire must have broke off, so they just tried to solder onto the back of the pin, made a cold solder joint, really wasn't attached, so luckily it was just the shield, you know, so it, it didn't have a horrible detrimental effect, but, you know, wasn't good. So what I'm going to do, and what I actually started doing, and I was like, oh, I forgot to turn the camera on is we are going to replace the connector uh, on the encoder, so this, this, this connector specifically is for the encoder, and I'm going to put on a DB9 connector. So this connector uh, is basically the same connector that you would see on a serial port for a you know PC, personal computer. Now the nice thing about these connectors is A, they're specifically designed for smaller gauge wire because typically you want to use small gauge wire with high frequency signals like an encoder. It's got less capacitance in it so you get cleaner signals along the long runs. And B, they have a back shell. So the back shell has a part that will crimp onto the jacket of the wire, okay, and then there will be no strain on the pins. All the strain and stress will be right here at the very end. And I dress this with a little tiny piece of shrink wrap, uh, but the shrink wrap I use, here's a bigger piece of it. You can get this at uh, any of the electronic suppliers, and basically it has adhesive on the inside of it. So as you heat this shrink wrap up to shrink it, the adhesive melts and liquefies, and then it will seal on all your conductors. So you don't get any of that seepage into the jacket uh, of the, of the uh, cable. So we'll uh, insert these pins, and these pins just, just slide in. Now, if you use one of these that are crimp style, make sure you have the correct crimper. If you don't use the correct crimp tool, all bets are off. You need to use the correct crimper if you're going to use crimp pins. The other nice thing about these DB9s is they come in solder cups, which means there's little tiny terminals on the back here, and you can solder the wires onto them, so you don't have to spend the money on a crimper. Now. I feel the crimp connections are a bit a better connection and they tend to break less often. So I'll get these pins in and we'll put the connector on the other end of the cable and we'll put the motor back in. One of the most important things in life is to learn from your mistakes. Well, we made a mistake and now we're learning. <laughs> so we got, the, uh, we got the motor rigged up to go back into the machine. And you notice I rigged it completely different. So what we have is we've got a nylon strap that's going down to the base of the motor. And then I've got the standoffs and the bolts put in place. And the straps are pulling sideways on the standoffs against the bolts. So these aren't going to go anywhere. And there's one on each corner. Okay. Now I've got a ratchet strap around the top here that's just keeping the nylon webbing from sliding on the side so the whole thing doesn't come out. And it is stable. Okay, so it's not going to go anywhere. We're not going to drop it. Fingers crossed. And uh, we'll be able to lower it right down onto the Z column head carefully and then get these bolts started so that we don't have to worry about what happened when we pulled it out. So we'll uh, set the cameras up. Let's get it in the machine. 
let's hoist it up and we're gonna try to get it back in the machine and again this is the most dangerous part when you have a load hanging high in the air with nothing underneath it so I raised it all the way up out of the machine in case it did fall it would just hit the floor and not you know damage anything else in the machine and then I pushed it into the machine and then very carefully lowered it into position now lifting it this way was way 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 better um, I would definitely do this again if I needed to take this motor out again this worked very well it was very secure very safe uh, and it was easy to do I was very happy that I chose to take the whole motor plate out and not try to pull the motor off of the motor plate because the hole size is so uh, tight between the pulley and the hole in the motor plate so now we're going to tighten our screws back down to make sure that those standoffs can't collapse on us again and then once we got a good amount of thread started into the head, into the Z head, then we'll start taking the straps off and rearranging the straps so that we can get the screws cinched down. And then once we got them cinched down, we will remove our lifting straps and our motor is reinstalled mechanically. So now we'll uh, torque everything down and cinch it down nice and tight. And then we can start uh, working on hooking all that electrical back up. So here's the fan. This is probably the hardest part of the whole job. That fan connector is a real pain to get back on. There's not a lot of space and it's kind of an awkward connector um, on that motor cooling fan. So now we're going to fish all of the wires uh, back through the little hole in the box. And again, here you want to start with the biggest stuff first. So I put the encoder wire through first and then fish the smaller wires because the more stuff you got through the hole the smaller and tighter the hole is going to get because there's stuff in it. So now we're going to refasten the box to the motor housing and you got to kind of fish the wires around to get all of the screws in. There's not a lot of room to work. This box is very full. It's a two compartment box. The rear of the box, all they have running through it is uh, two air lines and then the spindle, co the spindle coolant line um, for your machine coolant. And don't ask me why I chose to use an Allen key for this one. I've got a socket Allen drive sitting right next to me. Now once I got the box connected, the first thing we do is reconnect the ground. Always connect your grounds. So the, the box is now grounded um, properly and then we can start reconnecting everything. So we just reconnected the 120 volts to the spindle cooling fan. And now we're going to go through the process of reconnecting all the motor leads, which because we marked them is very easy to do. You just match the colors. Now I did buy different bolts. I felt the bolts that they used originally were just way too long. Um, you, you try not to have anything sharp pointing out um, that can puncture the electrical tape. Um, the electrical tape is pretty tough, but you know, the end of a bolt I didn't like sticking out as far as it was. So now we just uh, keep repeating. Now, there are so many wires because these motors can be dynamically switched between delta connection and Y connection. And when we do our motor and power videos, I'll explain the benefits of having that ability to switch between the two of them in a machine like this. But that's why there are six wires coming from the controller, and then there are 12 wires coming out of the motor. And the reason why there's 12 wires coming out of the motor is these motors are dual voltage as well as delta or Y. So you can run them on 208 or you can run them on 480. So that's why there's so many wires and connections in this box. So now we're just going to put an initial layer of electrical tape on and then kind of leave everything untucked for now until we run our tests and make sure everything's good. Then we'll wrap up a good amount of electrical tape and tuck it all back in. We put our grease fittings back on and then we can start reassembling the head. Now we're going to put the belt back on. And then again, this is a little, machine's a little different. To tighten the belt, you put a dial indicator on the nose of the spindle pulley and you want about 5 tenths of deflection of that spindle pulley when you tighten the belt. Then once the belt's tightened, we can put the drawbar bridge back on, the drawbar piston, reconnect our airlines on an electrical connector, and then, very important, you must remember to unblock your counterweight. 
don't forget to take out those blocking bars on your counterweight or you can mess your machine up. So we remove those bars and now we're ready to test. So we ran the spindle up incrementally all the way up to 7500 RPMs and it all ran good. So then we finished up by reinstalling the sheet metal. Had the chair out, so I figured I'd just stay in it. So the motor's back in, we hooked everything back up, we ran it, and the motor by itself runs pretty good. It does have still a little tiny bit of vibration to it, but it's not, it's like a hundred times better than it was, so it's not bad at all. Now, this motor had absolutely a ton of damage to it. And I don't believe any of the damage happened from the little whoopsies when we were taking it out. Um, I did some calculations and you would have had to dent that pulley pretty bad in order to exert enough sh of force on that motor shaft um, to bend it, which it was bent. So let's talk about the rebuild procedure and some of the heartburn that I had with the rebuild procedure. So I've contacted a local company and while in the end they made good on what they originally told me. I wasn't happy with the way that this went. So I contacted a local rebuild company, I gave them the spec of the motor, I gave them all the particulars, I gave them the RPMs it spins at, I told them there was an encoder on it, I told them there was a shrink fit pulley on it. I didn't hide anything. Gave them all the specs. Gave them the frame number, the bell door number, everything. They gave me a quote. I was happy with that quote. I thought it was a good price. Then what I did is I wrote up this sheet. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to I'm going to read you what it says. So at the top I have motor service request. I list the the ball door numbers, the frame size and the serial number so that they know which motor's mine. And I say the motor is in working order but starts to have a vibration at 3000 rpm. The service speed is 7500 rpm. So I told them what the problem is in a very brief sentence and I told them the max operating speed that I run this motor at. Then I listed bullet items. Please perform the following service. Disassemble, clean, and inspect. There's a lot of coolant and grease inside the motor because the filters weren't on it originally. I put those filters on, so it was just caked with junk. So I wanted them to take it apart, clean it up real good, and then inspect it. What's wrong with it? And when I dropped the motor off, I said, after inspection, please call me with a revised repair cost. Replace bearings. If they're going to take it apart to balance it, I thought I just need balancing. If they're going to take it apart to balance it, put new bearings in it. It's common sense. Balance rotor alone to 7500 RPM. So I wanted just the rotor and the shaft balanced by itself. Now why is that? I wanted that balanced by itself in case I ever go to replace the pulley. Because if the rotor's balanced by itself, I know it's good. And when you buy these pulleys, they're high speed pulleys, they should, I say should, be balanced. So you know, theoretically, you can swap out pulleys and not have to have the system balanced again. Then I said, balance the rotor and pulley assembly to 7,500 RPMs minimum, okay? And I said the pulley should be balanced, but if it's not, this will give an opportunity to balance just the pulley. So now we have a complete balanced rotating assembly. And I listed 7,500 RPMs. And it's very important that you communicate what RPMs your motor operates at because the balancing specs are significantly tighter as the speed goes up. So the forces of imbalance increase with the rotation squared, with the velocity squared. So as your RPMs go up, it's the square of the RPM. So double the RPM is four times the vibration. So the, the specs funnel and tighten really fast as the speed goes up. Reassemble and simple functional test. I wanted to put it together hook it up to a VFD, and spin it at 7500 RPM. That's all I wanted them to do. Okay, then I went into a little bit more detail. My thought was they would give this sheet to the repair tech. The pulley is a shrink fit pulley. Here are the manufacturer recommendations to remove said pulley. Please be careful not to overheat. So these pulleys are aluminum. If you overheat aluminum, if they're using oxyacetylene, you know, you could do some damage to it. 
The critical dimension for placement on the pulley shaft is 2.64 inches. So the pulley placed on the shaft needs to be 2.64 inches from the motor flange to the center flange of the pulley. That's my critical dimension to hold my belt alignment. There is a small encoder on the back of the motor. And then I gave instructions on how to remove the encoder. Then I put in the extra plug is for a cooling blower. So these motors don't have integral fans inside of them. It has a, a fan on the outside that's always powered. That way you can run at low RPM, high torque, and still keep your motor cool. Please ensure and confirm the wire routing during reassembly because that wire has to go through a certain hole so the wire will fit. Okay. Then this motor didn't have any wiring diagrams on it. So I took the time and I looked up and I found the wiring diagrams for them and I told them how to connect the motor in both a delta or a Y configuration whichever they wanted to run the test with. And then last it says no need to blast, scrape, or paint anything. A lot of people like to paint these things. It makes them look nice. I didn't want to paint it. I don't care what it looks like. You can't see it, right? Why should I spend the money to have it painted when you can't see it? And putting a coat of paint on it is just like putting an extra t-shirt on, okay? Eventually, when you got 100 t-shirts on, you're sweating, you're hot, you burn up, okay? So, you know, don't throw extra coats of paint on motors unless, you know, you really have to, or strip the old coats of paint off. Please feel free to contact me with any questions. As long as it spins vibration free, I'm a happy customer. Thank you. Okay, so very concise, step by step, line item by line item, list of things that I want to be done. Okay, so what actually happened? Well, I dropped the motor off. I asked them when it could be done, and they said um, five to ten business days. I was like, okay, great, you know, great schedule. So five business days, I didn't hear anything from them. So I called them and I said, hey, I haven't heard anything from you. Um, did you take it apart? Have you inspected it yet? And the answer was no, they were just starting on it. So I said, okay, call me back, you know, let me know. So the next business day, I didn't hear anything back from them. So I called them again the following business day. So I waited five days, gave them a phone call, waited a day, left them alone, called them the next day. You know, because they said they were taking it apart. I'd like to know, you know, by now we only got four days left until they said that it would be done by. And at the time, when I took the motor out, I didn't have any orders. Of course, you know, Murphy's Law, as soon as you send a part out of the machine, you get an order. So now I got an order, I have a customer waiting for their parts. So now my sense of urgency has increased, so I want them to hold their deadline. If I didn't have any parts on the machine to run, I'm not gonna bug them, right? I mean, if you don't have any parts to run, what's the difference? So then I call him that day and I ask him, okay, what's going on? And he's like, oh, okay, yep, your estimate for repair is double, over double, of what our original estimate was. And I got, I got a little frustrated, I'll admit. I, I, probably, I probably got a little bit short, you know, no screaming, no swearing, but I, I, got, a, I got a little, little short. Um, so why? Why is it double and what's going on? And I was told the reason why I doubled the price was because of the encoder on the motor. And I'm like, okay, why does a simple encoder double the price of the motor? Repair. Double. Over double. Okay, we're talking over $500 more than the original quote. Okay, so it was, it was a big amount. And I was told that they had to test the encoder. And it took them a while to test the encoder. Which I informed them that nowhere on my sheet does it say test the encoder. I know the encoder works just fine because the motor runs just fine and I can do rigid tapping very well. So there's nothing wrong with my encoder. And their reply was, well, what if it, what if it wasn't working? And I reiterated, I know it's working and it's only an $80 encoder. You want to charge me another couple hundred dollars for an $80 part. Okay, then it gets in a little more. Well one of the pins broke off of the connector, okay? So in my sheet, I specifically put in here. The wires on the encoder are not strain relieved very well. Use care and handling on both ends. <clears throat> now I've already replaced one end of the encoder wire. The other end of the encoder wire, the other connector, I knew it needed to be replaced. So I said, which end broke? <coughs> and they said, well, the machine side. I said, don't worry about it, I don't care. Just put it back together. And, you know, they hemmed and hawed about that a little bit. I'm like, I don't care. I don't want you guys to spend your time fixing an electrical problem that I can fix without a problem. 
which you saw in the video. So I got them to agree to that. So they call me back and they say, well, the back of the motor housing, the bearing spun and chewed up the journal, so it needs to be bored and sleeved. I said, okay, you know, they don't know that. So when I asked for an estimate of repair, they didn't know that that damage was done. That's fine. What's the adder? <coughs> it wasn't a bad adder. I agreed. Okay, fine. Bore it, sleeve it, put the bearing in it, call it a day. So now they call me back again. Uh, Mr. Dykes, um, you know, we put, the, we put the motor rotor on the balancer, <coughs> and they tested the runout on it, and your motor shaft has over 5,000 runout. That's a lot of runout. And I'm like, oh, okay. So you guys already did all this work to the motor. You bored and sleeved the back housing. I said, you know, first line item, please inspect the motor. Don't you check to inspect the motor? I mean, you know, run out, make sure everything's good. <clears throat> you know, find all the problems. Call the customer back with an estimate to repair. So I was, I was a bit peeved about that. So now I had to spend more money to you know, flame straighten the shaft. Now they were able to flame straighten the shaft and they got it uh, less than a thou. Okay. So in the end, I'm okay. But the end price was approaching double what I was originally quoted. And I'm not too happy about that. And if I would have known that that price would have went up that high, I can buy a brand new motor with pulley from Fidel CNC for sixteen hundred bucks, I would have done that. I would not have messed around with this motor at all if during the inspection they said, "Tim, the back bearing housing is is roached. It needs to be bored and sleeved." <coughs> oh, and by the way, <coughs> your motor shaft is bent. Excuse me. I would have said, "Okay, scoop up the parts, put it in a bag. I'll come pick it up, and I'll pay you, you know, whatever the, your cost was for disassembling and inspecting." Okay, that's how that would have went if I would have been given that knowledge. So now I get the motor back. I'm sorry this, this story is getting long, but I feel it's good to talk about this so that you can better protect yourself and communicate yourself, you know, if you do this. So I get the motor back. First thing I notice at the shop is they painted the damn thing. Yep. It says right in here, don't paint it. Well, they painted it. You know, they got paint on the wires. You know, I hate that. You know, okay, it's nitpicky, but you know what? I asked you not to paint the darn thing. Why'd you paint it? Okay, so then I get back to the shop. I take all the wrap off. You know, found the broken connector. Yeah, no big deal. You know, it it happens. That one didn't, you know, upset me or phase me at all. I was planning on replacing that connector anyway. Fine. So then I look at the pulley. And there's two big divots in my pulley now. Now, mind you, the little tiny ding I put in the pulley was just a minus, you know, little tiny scuff. You know, I, I fixed it before I sent it out for rebuild. So now there's two big divots on the inside edge of the pulley, and they're 180 degrees apart. So what do you think caused that? Well, they went and tried to use a puller on a heat shrunk pulley. And I will tell you that there is no way you will pull off a heat shrunk pulley. It's not going to happen. And they found that out and they bent my pulley in the process. So because they bent it, I noticed they had to rebalance it. So there's some drill holes in my pulley now that weren't there before and I believe that's attributed to the bend marks in the outside of the pulley. So, you know, that got messed up. And then the question is, well, you know, did the motor shaft get bent because they used a puller trying to pull that pulley off and they tightened the puller enough to bend the pulley, you know, the, the flange on the pulley? I don't know. It's all hearsay, you know, no, accus no uh, accusations of that, but it's possible. So, so in the end, I wasn't really happy with the way that this went down. Um, in the company's defense, they did deliver the motor on time. Actually, it was a day early, okay? And it does run, and it is balanced. Um, you know, I inspected my encoder. There's some micro scratches in the encoder. I don't know if it's affecting the machine or not. I don't think it is. I don't know if they were there before or not. I don't know. It is what it is. I might just order a new encoder. They're 85 bucks anyway, and throw a new encoder on it, you know, just for peace of mind. So, 
what can you do differently? Oops, excuse me. What can you do differently than what I did? Well, you know, I thought I did everything right, and I was really clear in my intentions and what I wanted and what I didn't want. What what I think happened was the the person at the front desk that wrote the order never communicated this to the person in the shop that actually performed the work. So I think there was a communication breakdown um, from the customer to the person actually performing the work. Because I guarantee you, if the person performing the work had read this sheet of paper, you know, we wouldn't have had any of the issues that we had. He wouldn't have ever tried to use a puller because I told him it was heat shrunk, you know. So I, I, I like to believe that to be true. So what I would recommend is if you drop a motor off to get rebuilt, definitely write up a sheet like this. You know, clearly state what you want done and what you don't want done, you know, and make sure everything is in writing. You know, I put everything in writing that I wanted, so there was no, there was no, well, you know, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, it's, it's in writing. Okay. Ask to speak to the person performing the work. That would be the one thing that I'm going to do different next time, is ask to speak to the person actually performing the work and make sure that that person gets the communication. Okay, it's a step that you shouldn't have to take, but it's going to save you some heartburn if this happens to you. Not saying it is, but if it does, it will save you some heartburn. It doesn't take long. Now, if the motor repair shop doesn't want you to talk to the tech that's actually going to perform the repair work, yeah, maybe call around and get a couple of extra quotes. I don't know. All right. So, in closing, there's the motor ordeal. You can see we messed up taking it out a little bit. We got lucky, we didn't break anything, we didn't hurt anything, didn't hurt me, so we're okay there. In the end, we got a functional motor, it spins pretty nice, at 7500 RPM there's a little tiny bit of vibration, but you know, I am not gonna get a nitpick over that, you know, these machines are not perfect, I think it's well within the specs, um, so, you know, spindle motor's good, the machine is a lot quieter than it used to be. I do think the spindle itself is out of balance a little bit, so uh, I might try to address the balance of the spindle. We'll see. I The bearings sound a little noisy, but I don't know. I, I was thinking about doing spindle bearings. I might hold off on that. I'm not, I'm not sure how I'm going to proceed on that. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, sorry for the, the long-winded story at the end, but I think it may be helpful to people that are going to pursue this path to, to hear that story so that they can make course corrections um, as they see fit. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the episode, and thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.